Hello everyone and welcome to Mariachi Podcast. Hola, todos y bienvenidos al Mariachi Podcast. I am your host, Javier Rodriguez. I am very excited to be here and to start this new podcast where I can give mariachi culture and mariachi music more exposure in this podcast platform. For those of you who have listened to any other podcasts, you know we always look forward to listening to something new and exciting, right? Well, that's just my plan. I have come up with some great ideas to line up interviews with mariachi friends, very talented musicians, and possibly great mariachi directors. I really look forward to bringing you a great podcast where we can learn and experience the world of mariachi directly from the men and women who have been doing this for years. In my opinion, to know what mariachi life is, well, we first have to know the person who's lived it, right? And what better place to go than a mariachi podcast where you can hear it straight from the source. After listening to several podcasts that I found entertaining, I started looking for a mariachi podcast that would keep me entertained and well, there aren't any, well any that I found for that matter. But if you do find one, please let me know so I can start listening to get an idea what I'm doing here. But for now, my idea for this show came because I wanted to know more, not only the fun part which is the music, but the, you know, the experience in each person's history. We've all seen those little interviews from the Facebook and YouTube, you know, the little shout outs they make. Uh, but no one has actually asked them what other mariachi musicians, like myself included, really want to know. You know, when and where did you start your mu musical career? How did you get where you're at now? You know, what, what what struggles and what was it like before, let's say, joining Vargas? You know, mariachi campero, sol de Mexico, cobre, and so on. Those are the questions I've often wondered to ask if I ever happen to get an opportunity. I mean, if you're a mariachi musician or enthusiast, wouldn't you like to listen to a conversation like that? For this first episode, I'm going to use this to introduce myself and give you a little bit of my background and history, if you will. And please excuse all the mistakes I'm about to commit, but as time progresses, uh, I promise to get better, okay? So, here we go. As I mentioned in the beginning, I am your host, Javier Rodriguez. Not to be confused with my tocayo Javier Rodriguez, uh, the ex-member, trumpet player of the renowned Mariachi Los Camperos in Aticano. I'm Javier Rodriguez from Dallas, Texas, and I play the harp for Mariachi Jalisciense here locally. I'm going to speak on my family history and tell you a few stories of how I got here and now I guess a mariachi podcast host. I was born in Colima, Colima, Mexico, you know, one of the smallest states uh, in Mexico. My father, Javier Rodriguez Ordorica, came to the U.S. in 1974, like many people before him, seeking work and a better future for my family. Uh, I am the second youngest of ten, five brothers and five sisters. My father qualified for the amnesty under the Reagan administration in the in the 1980s, and this is where my dad asked my mom, Maria Cruz, and under this same amnesty, to join him in 1982. When my family received our permits, uh, we arrived in Houston, Texas, where I started the first grade. We lived there for about five years before coming to Dallas, Texas, where I started the fifth grade in a little suburb of Dallas called Oak Cliff. Back then, a predominant black and Hispanic uh, family neighborhood. And as far back as I can remember, I was the only little Hispanic in my neighborhood. So all my buddies were, were African-American. I did have a few Hispanic, you know, friends. Uh, my best friends were, you know, Luis Contreras, Jose Gallardo, and Juan Lopez. Some others that, you know, were in the neighborhood as well. But those are, you know, my closest uh uh, best friends growing up in, in my in my neighborhood. Uh, I was in the south area of Oak Cliff, so I was referred to as the black Blacksican in my neighborhood school, you know, by schoolmates and friends, and they always got a kick out of that. And here's uh, where the magic started for me, because as a kid going into middle school and, you know, loving music so much, I, I guess uh, my love for music uh, came from listening to my parents' music, you know, especially when driving around with my dad and and him blasting his Norteñas and mariachi in his pickup. Um, as a toddler, my parents say that, that, you know, they remember I would always grab spoons and started beating my mom's cazuelas, her pots and pants, pretending, you know, to be a, a drummer uh, to any song that came out on the radio. And I was too young to remember this, but my, my older brothers and sisters uh, back, you know, back up my parents' story. So as far as I can remember, I, I have always loved music, you know, growing up. So uh, I decided to get into music a little deeper and pursue it. And what did I do? Well, I joined the you know a piano and music theory class in my middle school. Believe it or not, the middle school that I attended had a music theory and piano class. And, and since my side of town wasn't the, the very best, there there were not too many kids interested in joining a, a music and piano class. 
So there were maybe four four kids enrolled in this class that I could remember. And in a class this small, you know, slacking and goofing off wasn't a choice here because uh, my teacher, uh, Miss Scott, was one of those teachers who, who, threw, <laughs> who threw you out of the classroom if you didn't act right, you know. You, you've seen that movie Matilda, right? Uh, what's that? Uh, that mean woman that always got on Matilda's case. What was her name? Uh, Mrs. Miss Trenchbull, that's right. Yes, yes, Miss Trenchbull. That was Mrs. Scott and my music in piano class. So you didn't want to get on her bad side, that's for sure. As long as you came in and took her notes and practiced your scales and learned her music, you were in good standing. But if you ever failed to, to meet her goals, oh man, you, you weren't for surprise. And one day... One day I I wasn't feeling it, you know. I was just I was just giving it was not giving it my best effort to, and pretended to to play her assignments. And man, I, I don't I don't know if that day she had the eyes of a hawk and the ears of an owl, but you know she passed four other students playing the piano. That's that's how, that's how she pronounced it, piano. She could actually hear me playing the wrong notes. I mean, you try and dictate what you know tune is being performed while three others are, you know rehearsing their pieces you know can you do it <laughs> well you know mrs scott sure could and as she's approaching and with a look of disbelief and i'm trying as fast as i can to sit up correctly and get back on track but she's already you know she's already got me and with her bald of fist on her hips you know standing over me she uh she she looks at me and you know like in disbelief and and this is what she told me and i'll never forget it javier boy don't you know i can hear you Tell you what, if you don't play those twerk ball blues correctly for me, for your final recital, I'm going to break your fingers and make you play them with your feet. Now, what's it going to be? <laughs> Ask me again if I've goofed off, you know. And uh, let me tell you, when I came to stage for my final recital, I, I was so terrified. You know, I was looking, I was looking everywhere and my hands were so sweaty. I was just a nervous wreck. And behind the hurt, behind the curtains, I could still hear Miss, Miss Scott, you know, yelling, Javier! Boy, don't you let me down, you know, like that, like if that helped my confidence in any way. And at that same time and, you know, moment, I see my mother come into the auditorium. She finds her seat and we lock eyes and she waves at me. And, you know, that's all the confidence boost I was really desperately needing, you know, my, my rock to cling on. And that, not, that night, uh, I remember I rocked the shit out of those 12 bar blues and, and Mrs. Scott, well, she never got on my case after that. So time goes by and it's time to move to to high school and I have no choice but of course to go to the closest school to me which had a great great marching band program. Having to know you know how to read music now and decided to enroll at this school the the great south oak cliff high school and as i am getting ready to join you know this marching band um on the first week of school and you know i was trying to get a, an instrument assigned to me i see a uh, a tall hispanic gentleman walk into the band hall of south oak cliff high school and i can see that uh, he holds a conversation with our band director at the time and they talk for about five minutes and soon after that the uh, you know, the conversation, the band director turns and, you know, he holds his hand up with a closed fist, meaning silence and attention. And he introduces his Hispanic gentleman as his, his friend, Mr. Moises E. Molina from Adamson High School. And, he, you know, he stated that he is looking for young men and, and women who who would be interested in joining his mariachi and sonora program being, you know, held at his high school. So who's interested? You know, yelled out our band director. And I looked around and, you know, nobody raised their hand and of course, the band was 99% African-American, you know, at the time. And I, I was the 1%, you know, again, the little brown spot in the band. And, who, you know, who's going to raise their hand, right? I mean, I raised my hand and, you know, to my chest. And Mr. Molina was quick to point me out. All my friends and, you know, who came from my middle school were, were yelling, man, you sell out, damn it, Blacksican, what are you doing? You you belong over here, you know, and... um so he pulls me out into the hallway and Mr. Molina shakes my hand and first thing he says is, uh, where do you live? And I told him my address. And, what instrument do you? I said, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been issued one. What do you play? 
the piano, I answered. Piano? Piano? What are you doing in a marching band? What do you think? You're going to be going and, you know, be a piano in the middle of uh, in the middle of the field? You're going to be a piano player in the middle of the field? And, you know, he, he said, uh, Javier, how, how would you like to be part of a mariachi? Mariachi, I replied, you know. I've never seen a mariachi march on the field before. Are you being funny with me, sir? I'm like, no, I'm just saying, shut up. You know, he yelled. I was like, what? I'm in, I'm in to play for a mariachi program and perform for audiences on stage, not field, sir. That's what he told me. To be honest, I didn't know what I just got myself into. He told me, tell your parents to unenroll you from the school and, you know, give them this form. The forms were called a hardship transfer in those times. I don't know if they still are. So my mom and I go through the, the process of going through, you know, going downtown and getting um, the paperwork in order and finally get this hardship transfer approved. And here I am now, a freshman at the at the great W.H. Adamson High School. And as far as I know, you know, one of the one of the first high schools in Texas to have a a real, real good mariachi program, you know, Mariachi Azul y Blanco and a damn good one at that. And here's where I can say my mariachi life begins. Uh, Mr. Molina started me off in the mariachi beginners class for violin. I picked up learning the violin very well. I got good instruction and lessons from our first violin and lead vocalist for the school, for the school's mariachi, Alex De Leon, a good friend and violinist who later came to be a great Tejano music artist for the Tejano group Stampede. I practiced and performed for about a semester until Mr. Molina decided uh, to move me to Guitarron since his seniors were graduating and needed a replacement early for the following year. And for my listeners that don't know what a Guitarron, it's the acoustic bass for mariachi, also the biggest instrument that's in the armonia section next to the harp. I got introduced to the Guitarron by a good friend and classmate Keith Fulcher, a big, tall, stocky white dude that could play the hell out of the Guitarron. He gave me great advice and pointers on the guitarron. Also, there was Michael Edwards, tiny. You know, here uh, he was a huge black dude that could also play the guitarron very well. I mean, here's here I am getting taught by the two uh, unfamiliar races in the mariachi genre. A black and white dude, you know, teaching the Mexican guy how to play the guitarron. But, you know, but nevertheless, very appreciative and, and had the most, and I still have the most uh, respect for these, these guys. So, guys, if you're listening, thank you, fellas. Come my sophomore year, uh, again, my plans would change, right? Right when I was in my comfort zone with the guitarron, you see there was Griner Middle School, who also had a, a great uh, little mariachi program, who was uh, the feeder school to W.H. Adamson High School. So there were freshmen coming in that also had uh, guitarron players, and basically you had to compete to have your spot in this mariachi, Azul y Blanco. Uh, you know, this made me grow impatient and started to wonder if it, this was even something I wanted to do. I was back and forth on the guitarron and violin, and by this time it was my junior, my new junior year, and, uh, and I can remember that Mr. Mo that, that he would miss uh, school often, and all of us in the marching band, Sonora and Mariachi, were, you know, the guys that were trying to figure out what was going on, you know, what was wrong, but uh, what we did notice is that he had lost a tremendous amount of, of weight since he, we know we last saw him the previous year. To be honest, I believe he was keeping, you know, his health very, very private. And we were not aware of how, how bad Mr. Mo was. I guess you can say we as kids, you know, didn't know how short life until, you know, until we, Mr. Molina left us, you know, on March 25th, 1994. And it really hit home for me because I really looked up to him, you know. The, sh the, the short time we had together, he taught me so much. Not only, you know, not only music, but to be a better person, to be a productive, you know, human being in society. He always challenged us to be better, and for that, I'm forever grateful. So rest easy, Mr. Mo. So in the middle of my junior year, and you know, not knowing if I should continue, and I remember Miss Everman coming and telling us to keep our heads up and motivating us. Ms. Everman was Mr. Molina's assistant, or better yet, his backbone, because I honestly believe without her, I don't think Mr. Mo would have, you know, kept booking events and keep things organized. We all, um, we all remember this. His office was such a mess with, you know, with violins, this trumpet strings and sheet music. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And 
Her planner was all that she needed to bail him out of his mess when he couldn't find the address or contact of the person, you know, for the gig we were performing that week. So Mrs. Delia Everman sees how frustrated I am about losing, you know, about to lose my position as guitarron to a freshman. And uh, she asked me, you know, why don't you get back on the violin? And I told her the violin section already has eight violins and I really don't want to start learning music all over on the vi you know, on the instrument at this point, you know. That day uh, I sat in my car and, and well it was it wasn't even a car, it was a station wagon. It was a my first car was a nineteen seventy eight Pontiac Bonneville station wagon with the fake wood stickers on both sides. All my friends referred it as to Javier's hearse. <laughs> it was hideous. But uh, I did manage to give rides home to a few girls from school. Anyway, I uh, wondering if I should continue in this mariachi program, and um, you know, I am starting at, my, you know, I'm staring at my stack of CDs. You know, back in, back then, having those hard shell CD cases or the CD sleeve book was, you know, the thing. Back, you know, teenagers in the early '90s, you wanted to let everyone know you had a CD player in your car. Well, something that caught my eye, sitting on, you know, on top of all my CDs, I see the CD cover of uh, Sones de Jalisco. And what caught my eye was the harp player, Maestro Arturo Mendoza, holding a harp, you know, the Jalisco harp. And I thought to myself, man, it would be awesome to play the harp and the mariachi. But then again, where in the hell am I going to find a Jalisco harp here in Dallas, you know? So I go around asking the local professional groups where you know, I could possibly find one. And a professional guitarron player by the name of Don, Don Lino Cuevas, you know, que en paz descanse. He told me, you know, de empeñar una, Javiercito. I, I just pawned one. Just pawned a heart not too long ago, you know. You might want to go check it out. I was, uh, you know, I asked for the, the pawn shop address where he took it. And there I go straight to the pawn shop. And I'm looking for it everywhere. And I can, and you know, I can't find it. And the man at the counter says, you know, what are you looking for? And I said, uh, some man brought a, a harp, you know, a Mexican Jalisco harp. And he pointed to the roof. You mean that one? You know, these guys put the harp as an ornament on the ceiling, you know, corner next to some saddles and some prop cactus junk. I don't know. I asked if it was uh, for sale and if I, you know, could please, you know, if I could take a look at it. So they brought it down and I could see that it was all intact. I asked, you know, how much they were asking and they replied $500. You know, <laughs> as a teenager, you know, in high school, I, I sadly asked them to put it back. I mean, where where am I going to get $500 from, right? You know, I'm in high school. In the early 90s, you know, $25, $40 could get you a date, the movies, and the burger afterwards and have a good time. $500, really? So I go back to the school, you know, the next day, and I tell Miss Everman, I think I'm going to call it quits, Miss Everman. I, I want to play in this mariachi program, but I really don't want to. I really, I really want to stick to one instrument, and the only solution, is, you know, that I have is to, to play the harp. The harp, she replied. Where in God's green earth are you gonna find a harp for you to play in this mariachi? Well, Miss Everman, believe it or not, I found one for sale at a pawn shop nearby. You know, that same day after school, she told me to to hop in her car and we go look at this harp. So we went, and she saw it and asked me, you know, who's going to teach you? this instrument Javier and I said I'll figure it out because the hardest thing to figure out right now Miss Everman is to how come up is how to come up with five hundred dollars to pay for it, you know. She took a long good stare at it and she asked the salesperson, You take checks? I was like, No way she's just gonna pay for this harp and her words to me were Javier, if you promise me, you know, you won't leave the mariachi program, I will buy you this harp. Now with the gigs we line up you can pay me back, you know. Of course, the rest is history. I started looking, uh, I'm sorry, I started taking short lessons from uh, from Felix Garay, and, uh, and also a former student of Mr. Molina. And the person who actually took over the mariachi program after Mo, after Mr. Mo passed, he's now the owner of a, a website that sells mariachi music online, uh, Mariachi Maestro, I believe. Um, he did not know too much of harp music, especially, you know, mariachi harp music that he, he could transpose. But he could take out, you know, uh, music from any recording and, you know, try to transpose parts for me. And so we practiced on that and, and I was, you know, comfortable enough to performing gigs. 
And uh, another key tool for me were, were tapes. I remember going to the Pulga, the flea market, and I, and I would uh, buy Jarocho music tapes. And I would listen to those tapes so much that, they, you know, to get familiar with the chord progressions, that they would actually start to fade how much I would play them over and over and over again. Uh, I wore the hell out of those tapes. And so as time progresses, I, I just keep practicing and performing on the harp, you know. I had little guidance, no actual mariachi harp teacher at this time, and no one that I, you know, and, you know, one time I was invited to the Mariachi Vargas Extravaganza in San Antonio, uh, where I got the opportunity to, to meet the, the great Arturo Mendoza, the harp player at the time. Remember that CD cover I was telling you about? Yep, that guy. You know, and me being scared and, you know, shy to even approach him. Uh, and all I could do was just watch him, you know, warm up for for the stage prep and sound check. I, I was so mesmerized as how, how he made playing the harp so easy. And when he pulled those those bass strings on that harp, it really sounded as he had a, a guitarron attached to that harp. It was so bold and beautiful. You know, he, uh, he would usually stand by himself and get lost in the music he was performing. So focused into himself and... When the concert started, I, I could hear the, the harp so clearly and vibrant, you know, his stance so perfect and his suit flawless. You know, to, to this day, how I regret not, not getting a, a, at least, a, you know, the chance to introduce myself. I, I know I would have at least learned something, anything for that matter. Several years later, you know, the, the great Arturo Mendoza passed away and the mariachi world, uh, you know, lost a legend. It wasn't until my senior year that I got to meet Julio Martinez in the same, you know, Vargas Extravaganza in 1996, where he took me into his classes. And since there were so few students with harps at the time, I all, oh, if most, maybe three students that year, I could, I actually took one of, I mean, I felt like I was taking one-on-one -on -one classes from him and absorbed every bit of it as much as I could actually. And and he let me practice on his harp and it sounded so much better than mine. I mean, my harp looked so beat up. It actually looked like someone used leftover wood parts to put it, you know, together. I mean, it was an ugly harp, but you know what? It was mine and I played it the best I could. Poor thing. So as, uh, so I asked him, you know, quite frankly, you know, how much was, you know, was, was a harp like his and where I could buy one in the future? And he said, you know what? I'm actually selling it if you're interested. So, you know, la estoy vendiendo si te interesa, Javier. At the moment, uh, you know, that moment of the pawn shop just came over all over me again, you know, not knowing damn well that I was going to have the money he was asking at the time. And he had a, if I remember correctly, a Roberto Morales harp size one with no levers and $1,500, $1,500 is what he was asking. I was like, I don't have that type of uh, money, Julio. And, you know, no worries, you know, I'll give you my information. And when you do come up with the money, you can come see me in Mexico. So, you know, I graduated, got a decent job, and this job had a, um, that I was holding, and it, it always, uh, it held a conference every year in Mexico City, and, and I took advantage, and I, I called Julio, and I asked if the, the harp, he, you know, he, he was, he had, was, was still for sale, and it was still available, and he said it was, you know, so I flew out there for my vacation, and I bought the harp, and, and he, he took, you know, he took the time even then, to give me some more, you know, fundamentals. And he is to this day a great harpist, I mean, musician, and, you know, but most importantly, a great friend. You know, you can find his recordings on iTunes, Spotify, and in all digital music stores. And uh, in 2003, I came across a Paraguayan harp uh, player and a maestro, um, El Maestro Lorenzo Gonzalez here in Dallas, where... He also uh, took me under his wings and he taught me a different technique, which was Paraguayan music. And I've and I find a way to implement this to, to, to mariachi. It's just beautiful music, you know. And again, a great musician and, and friend as well. And uh, in 2013, you know, we fast forward and uh, uh, I felt as though I needed, you know, more. You know, like again, you know, just little pointers here and there and, you know, little one-to-one -one you know, classes that, you know, my friends and maestros were, were showing me. And I met a a good friend um, on, on Facebook. Um, and in 2013, I flew to Ventura, California and got, you know, in, 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 officially 
introduced to Jarocho music by my great teacher and Jarocho harpist, El Maestro John Robles. And remember those tapes I talked about of, you know, earlier? Well, now I have the real deal. And, and man, let me tell you, I completely fell in love with Jarocho music. Maestro Robles, you know, put on a little show for me and and a few of his guests at his beautiful home with another great harpist and vocalist, um, Maestro Moraza. And I don't want to, you know, massacre his first name, is, uh, but uh, his last name is Moraza. And after that, I, I now got a collection of Jarocho music on my Spotify playlist, you know. So, guys, if you're listening, gracias from the bottom of my heart. You, you guys keep the torch burning for La Musica Jarocha. Thanks again, guys. And um, I guess since you can say since 1994 up to now, I've been playing the harp. And and even now, I'm still learning. I have played with uh, many great uh, mariachi groups here in Dallas. And let me tell you, um, really, as a musician, you, you never stop learning, you know. Not, o- not only did I learn my uh, by sheet music and, you know, rehearsals, but... You know, by by harsh words, by and, and humiliations by other musicians. You know, mariachi musicians who who always had something to say because they felt they were they were better than you. You know, you know. Well, guess what? You know, you thought they had only they had uh, bullies in school, but you also have mariachi musicians bullies. You know, uh, and to be honest, I have to be grateful for those guys. You know, the, the what do they, they call them? The haters. You know why? Because they push me to be better. You know, there's not one musician that can tell you he knows everything about music. You know, that's a lie. Uh, the most important thing I have learned in all my years performing with different groups and artists is just honest, honestly to be humble. You know, there, there's nothing worse than the musician that gives you shit for not knowing your music or laughs at you, humiliates you in front of other musicians. You know, those aren't musicians. Now, don't get me wrong. There is creative criticism where a guy that's teaching you you know, tells you, you know, out of frustration that you're, you know, that you're part, that, that you're playing, you need to step up your game, you know, fix your errors, you know, and then there, then there's just making remarks to make you feel bad. And let me tell you, all, I have gone up to musicians to say hello, or, you know, just to make small talk. And they look at you like you're unworthy to talk to them. Like you're not even on their level, you know, sometimes you, you don't even have to talk to them because you can just feel the bad, you know, the bad vibe coming off of them. But, my advice to those who are and have been in these groups is to keep pushing. Learn from your mistakes and practice, practice, practice. You'll always have the last laugh when, you know, in due time and out of nowhere, the music, the solo or song you kept messing up on is executed to perfection. Then they will come up with another excuse. You know why? Because you'll never satisfy the gloating musician, El Marro. Because in my opinion, by now you have become better than what they were expecting. And you're proving them wrong consistently. Those guys in good groups, they don't last long. They move from group to group because no one can stand them. You know, that's my opinion. You know, don't become one of those maros. I don't have a name for them. I guess mariachi bullies, assholes. I don't know. You know, but in all seriousness, to all my listeners, humble. Keyword, humble. And learn your music. Be a complete mariachi musician or musician in general. And I guess you can ask, what is a complete mariachi musician, right? Like all the maestros I just mentioned earlier, those guys to me are the complete musicians, you know? The ones that have gained the respect of others by being a leader, you know, giving others without being asked to do el que se entrega completo a esta música y cultura y la respeta. That also goes for el traje charro, you know, that's another topic. You know, the El Traje Charro, you know, some people or some musicians, I'm sorry, they get it confused with the costume. It's not to be used as a Cinco de Mayo party prop. You know, if your botonadura is broken, fix it. If your traje is dirty, take it to the cleaners. Iron your shirts, charros. I mean, I can keep going, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll leave that for another topic or episode. And uh, this is what I, you know, want to know from you. Give me your experiences and how did you get to where you're at now? What are your battles? and What have you won and lost to get where you're going? Where do you want to be? Let's make this podcast just another way to put an idea together. And, um, well, that sums it up for me in this episode, ladies and gentlemen. 
like I st stated before, I started this podcast to give the mariachi world and our culture more exposure. If you have ideas or know someone you would like for me to interview, please write to us. I have spoken to some great mariachi friends, like I said, directors and musicians for one-on-one -on -one interviews, so stay tuned for that. I will also start my YouTube channel shortly where you can find the videos and pictures of these interviews. Remember that you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under Mariachi Podcast. My friends, I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to reading some of your comments and questions. My email is mariachipodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and talk to you soon. Music